Thank you very much, everyone, for, for attending today. Thank you for inviting me to introduce my book, The East is Still Red, Chinese Socialism in the 21st Century. If I may, I'd like to just quickly start by briefly paying tribute to the Canadian communist Isabel Crook, who sadly passed away this morning in Beijing at the age of 107. She was born in Sichuan in 1915, the daughter of Canadian missionaries, and she was a lifelong supporter of and participant in the Chinese Revolution. Um, the investigation that she and her husband David wrote about land reform in the liberated territories in the 1940s, called Ten Mile In, remains one of the classics of English language reporting on Chinese socialism. And, you know, all, all foreign friends of China owe her a great deal, including uh, uh, the responsibility to take her work forward. So, on to the book. I had two central motivations in writing this book. Firstly, I wanted to help mobilise people against an escalating new Cold War, which I consider to be an extremely dangerous phenomenon. Second, I wanted to contribute to a Marxist understanding of contemporary China, and, and particularly to engage with and answer those on the left who consider China to be a capitalist or even an imperialist country. So what I'd like to focus on today is the latter of those issues, understanding the class character of China, because there's a huge amount of confusion on this topic. Um, and it's obviously relevant to the work of our movement in general and to your organisation in particular. Uh, you know, a lot of people consider China to be a capitalist country. It's easy enough to understand why right-wingers believe this. China is obviously a pretty major success story. It's gone from being one of the poorest countries in the world to being the second largest economy in the world in dollar uh, GDP terms, the largest in purchasing power parity terms. Its life expectancy used to be several years below the global average. Now it's several years above the global average and has indeed surpassed that of the US. China's gone from a state of extreme technological backwardness to being a science and technology powerhouse. So sure, Right-wingers would prefer to attribute all of this to capitalism rather than socialism. Why not? To fit China's rise into their worldview, they say that, well, China dropped all this socialism nonsense after the aberration that was the Mao Zedong period, took up capitalism and prospered thereafter. And in these days of new Cold War, the right-wing narrative has expanded a little bit to include the idea of China's rise being the result of theft, plagiarism, spy balloons, and, you know, the world domination schemes of these cynical Fu Manchu type characters that run the Communist Party of China, and so on. Marxists, of course, have no particular interest in attributing China's successes to capitalism, but many of them still struggle to see how it can be considered socialist. After all, there are quite a lot of things about China that don't sit particularly well with our vision of what socialism is supposed to look like. For example, there's private capital in China, there's the exploitation of labour in China, there's huge inequality, there's engagement with the capitalist global economy. Um, you can walk in the centre of Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou and you'll see branches of Starbucks, you'll see McDonald's, KFC, Nike and so on. These enormous multinational brands have penetrated China and many on the left feel uncomfortable about that. Maybe some people even remember the first McDonald's opening in Moscow, connected with Gorbachev's so-called perestroika reforms. That was in 1990, and all of a sudden in 1991, the Soviet Union stopped existing. And looking back, we can obviously see a, a causal relationship, not specifically with McDonald's, but with the whole political trajectory of perestroika. China's got nearly 500 billionaires, second only to the US, which has 735. Of course, China's a huge country, and proportionally speaking, so measured proportional to the population, China's actually below the global average in terms of its number of billionaires. Uh, and interestingly, by the way, that number is, has been on a downward trend over the last few years, unlike elsewhere in the world. But anyway, China's got billionaires. There certainly weren't any billionaires in the Soviet Union. There weren't any billionaires in the German Democratic Republic. Um, and indeed, China's market reforms have gone way further than Soviet market reforms ever did. So there are quite a few things about China that don't feel terribly socialist or that perhaps don't fit very comfortably with what our notion of what socialism is or our vision of what we ourselves as communists are fighting for, are struggling for. 
Um, so there's a great deal of confusion, and in my view, that confusion is understandable, and it needs to be seriously addressed. Um, now, if there are some things that don't feel terribly socialist, there are also some things that don't feel terribly capitalist, uh, especially in relation to poverty alleviation, especially in relation to living conditions. The bottom line is that living standards have increased consistently and dramatically throughout the period of existence of the People's Republic of China. Life expectancy in 1949, at the time of the founding of the People's Republic, was around 35. Less than 10% of the population was literate. 90% of the population was situated in the countryside, the majority as tenant farmers and agricultural labourers suffering grinding poverty in a thousands of year old feudal system. Women faced unspeakable levels of oppression. The vast majority of people lacked access to health care, electricity, gas or running water. Millions died every year due to malnutrition. So if we consider People's China both before 1978, what's generally referred to as the Mao period, and after 1978, the reform and opening up period, both have been phenomenally successful in terms of improving living conditions. By the time of Mao, Mao Zedong's death in 1976, life expectancy had reached around 67. So that means that in the space of 27 years, from 1949 to 1976, average life expectancy had increased by 32 years, like almost doubling. That's historically completely unprecedented. Illiteracy had been largely eliminated. Feudalism was comprehensively defeated. And the most extensive land reform program in history was enacted. The social position of women improved beyond recognition. Basic healthcare and education were made available throughout the country for the first time. And the population level actually doubled in that period between 49 and 76. So, you know, while there are all those particularly right-wingers who want to claim that the Mao period was a terrible failure and a disaster for the Chinese people, etc., reality doesn't actually bear that out. There were, of course, problems. There were, of course, contradictions and excesses. Particularly, uh, particularly in relation to the Great Leap Forward, particularly in relation to the Cultural Revolution. But it's indisputable that um, um, the Chinese people experienced a dramatic and unprecedented improvement in their living conditions during the first three decades of socialist construction. But conditions of life have also improved continuously in the reform period from 1978, when China is alleged to have gone capitalist. Chinese people live an awful lot better now than they did 45 years ago. And that's their lived reality, regardless of whether it fits with people's particular understanding of what socialism looks like. China now has a middle income population of around 500 million people. These are people who own their own homes, who have some disposable income, who are able to travel and so on. Even poor people in China have a roof over their heads. They may not have much in the way of disposable income, but their children get a minimum of nine years free education. They have access to health care, even if it's relatively basic. You know, if they get sick, they get treatment. If they need to see a doctor, they see a doctor. They're not in debt bondage, which, you know, is if you consider their counterparts in most of the rest of Asia, is a very important thing. Um, they don't live in peri-urban slums. They've got access to modern energy. The vast majority have, you know, a refrigerator and the basic amenities of modern life. They've got water piped into their homes. They're entitled to a pension, which is pretty small, but is moving in the right direction. And these things are guarantees. When China launched its targeted campaign to fully eliminate extreme poverty, it defined extreme poverty not just on the basis of an income threshold, though the definition does include an income threshold, but also as meeting a set of criteria, including reliable access to adequate food and clothing, guaranteed access to medical services and safe housing with drinking water and electricity, and at least nine years of free education. So when we talk about China's rural poor living a relatively dignified life, we're not only talking of the average, we're actually talking about all of them. Like they might be considered as poor, but it's a very different category of poverty to that which can be seen elsewhere in Asia or Africa or Latin America or the Middle East or the Caribbean or the Pacific. The United Nations Development Programme describes China as having carried out the most rapid decline in absolute poverty ever witnessed. Why China? Um, why has the most rapid decline in absolute poverty happened in China and not 
in India or in Indonesia or indeed in the US or Canada? Clearly, the answer to that question lies in its system of political economy. The capitalist system cannot attend to the needs of the masses like that. The capitalist class simply wouldn't allow resources to be directed so consistently towards solving the problems of ordinary people. That's not a matter of capitalists being bad people. It's because of the, the, the very nature of capital, as you know, is to expand at all costs. In as much as working people have any support in capitalist societies, which, well, you people are in the US and you don't get much support. We get a little bit more here in Britain, but it's gradually being taken away from us. It's because the working class has fought for that over the course of decades and centuries. And because the capitalist class lives in constant fear of socialism. But these are concessions. They can be taken away and they never constitute a priority or a long-term strategy of capitalist governance. The US is one of the richest countries in the world. And yet, there are tens of millions of people there that lack access to health care. Around half a million are homeless. And furthermore, the US's wealth relies to a considerable degree on spreading poverty, war and destruction in the global south. So wealth under capitalism always has its counterpart in poverty. And, and on that basis, we, we should just say eliminating poverty is very much a socialist thing. You know, if capitalism could solve the problem of poverty, if capitalism could end homelessness, if it could ensure that everybody had enough food to eat, if it could ensure that everyone had access to, you know, a decent quality health care and education, then frankly, those of us on the left might have to revisit our worldview. Well, don't worry, comrades. Um, before you tear up your party cards, I'd urge you to consider another possible reason that China succeeded to such a degree in tackling poverty, and it's that it's a socialist country where political power lies ultimately in the hands of the working people. Uh, there are some other areas where China's making incredible progress and accomplish accomplishing remarkable things. In recent years, China's emerged as the undisputed global leader in renewable energy, biodiversity protection, and green transport systems. Why isn't it Britain that's done that? Why isn't the US leading the way when it comes to preventing climate breakdown or the European Union? The, the world has known about the problem for long enough. It was at the Rio summit in 1992 that the countries of the world agreed to coordinate on meaningful and systematic action to address climate change. How much better have things got since then? The answer, frankly, is not at all. The problem's actually much worse than it was because we've continued emitting greenhouse gases at a shocking rate. The US is still emitting carbon dioxide at about the same rate as it was in 1992, and that's in spite of exporting the bulk of its industry to the developing world, not least China. So we've left the problem to the market. We've absorbed this neoliberal wisdom that the profit motive and the dynamic between supply and demand will have a magical effect and all problems will be solved. And here we are three decades later, and the proxy war in Ukraine has Western Europe reopening coal mines and US fracking companies making an absolute killing. The Biden government in the US and the Sunak government in Britain are issuing new drilling licenses left, right and centre. You know, Christmas has come early for fossil fuel capitalism. So what about China? China accounted for 55% of all renewable energy investment last year. It has more installed renewable energy capacity than the G7 countries combined. Its solar capacity is now greater than that of the rest of the world combined. Coal has gone from 80% of its power mix two decades ago to around 50% now, and it continues its fast decline. Around 99% of the world's electric, uh, electric buses are made in China. Shenzhen in, in Guangdong is the first city in the world to have a fleet of 100% electric buses. Around 70% of the world's high-speed rail can be found in China, which compares quite favourably with the 0% that can be found in the United States. Forest coverage has doubled from 12% in 1980 to 24% today, uh, the result of the biggest forestation project the world has ever seen. China's announced its commitments to peak carbon emissions by 2030 and reach zero carbon by 2060. And these targets are... You know, they're not just figures, they're not just slogans, they're actively informing policy and planning at every level. And just as with China's successes in poverty alleviation, all this wouldn't be possible 
if China were a capitalist country, if the capitalist class were the ruling class in China. Precisely because the major levers of the economy are in the hands of the government, it's possible for China to actively reorient its economy towards a sustainable future. In line with Xi Jinping's comment that we must strike a balance between economic growth and environmental protection. We will be more conscientious in promoting green, circular and low carbon development. We will never again seek economic growth at the cost of the environment. We could also talk about different countries' responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. China went all out to protect human life. If China had pursued a similar policy to the US or Britain, it would have been expected to have suffered upwards of 5 million deaths. Again, this comes down to the structure of the Chinese economy and the location of political power in the working people. And for socialists to want to deny these achievements or to attribute them to capitalism, frankly, does not make a great deal of sense. So what is the Chinese economy all about? The CPC has always been very clear about what it's doing. It uses market forces within the overall context of a planned and state-run economy to stimulate the development of the productive forces. They consider that the development of the productive forces is the principal task of the primary stage of socialism. So in the, in the late 1970s, the Chinese leadership recognised that 30 years after the victory of the revolution, 30 years after the founding of, founding of New China, the country was still a very long way behind the advanced capitalist countries in terms of science and technology and in terms of living standards. Yes, they'd ended feudalism, they'd collectivised the land, they'd made progress in industrial development and they'd established a comprehensive social welfare system. But China was still a poor country. And although the masses in the countryside weren't starving, nor were they living well. So the CPC developed a strategy to attract foreign capital, to learn from foreign technology, to move forward the process of industrialization, to move forward the process of modernization, to create jobs, to create wealth. And you know, you have to say they've been phenomenally successful in all of that. And they've done so while continuing to maintain overall state control of the economy. The government maintains a very tight control over what they call the commanding heights, heavy industry, energy, transport, communications and foreign trade. The financial system is dominated by the state-owned banks. So that means that the allocation of financial resources is largely in the hands of the state, which is primarily accountable not to private shareholders, but to the people. And that's precisely why China has so quickly become the world leader in renewable energy, for example, or, or why you can go to the poorest parts of Western or Central China and find world class infrastructure. You know, in, in Britain, the government and media have been talking about levelling up for decades um, in terms of improving the situation in the north of the country and in Wales and elsewhere um, and balancing the economic situation out with London, and I'm sure the same is the case with, with areas of the United States, but nothing ever happens because it isn't deemed profitable. China's where levelling up actually happens because the economy is directed towards the benefit of society. You've got plenty of private capital in China, but it exists at the grace of the state. It exists to the extent that it serves the overall interests of the people. A large part of the economy is in private hands, but is subjected to stringent regulation. And as such, you know, the whole system is a very long way from the neoliberal consensus that prevails in the West. The economy continues to be directed at the top level on the basis of five year plans. China's land isn't privatized. It's owned and it's managed at the village level. So China's got a mixed economy. It's very different to what existed in the Soviet Union. It's very different to what existed in the European people's democracies. And indeed, it's very different to what exists today in Cuba or the DPRK, although it has to be said it's very similar to what exists in Vietnam. It's experimental and to some degree it's also dangerous. You know, the existence of foreign capital, the insertion into global value chains, the existence of very wealthy people with an interest in, in maintaining and expanding their wealth all of these things introduce contradictions, all of them introduce problems, threats, dangers. But what socialist experiment in history hasn't faced contradictions, problems, threats and dangers? As long as we live in a world that continues to be dominated by imperialism, building socialism will always be extremely difficult. That was the case with 
those socialist countries that sadly no longer exist. And it remains true today, you know, in China, in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Korea, in Vietnam, in Laos, in Nicaragua. What we can say is that 45 years after the initiation of reform and opening up, the People's Republic of China still exists, is still developing, is still meeting the needs of its people, and is still playing a profoundly positive role in global affairs. Its flag stays red. And, you know, given our own somewhat meagre achievements on the road to socialism ourselves, we should probably have the humility to learn from China. Uh, Fidel Castro was particularly clear on this topic. Um, he said in 1993, if you want to talk about socialism, you mustn't forget what socialism has done in China. Once it was a country of hunger, poverty, disasters. Today, there's none of that. Today, China feeds, clothes, cares for, and educates 1.2 billion people. I think China's a socialist country, and Vietnam is a socialist country as well. And they insist they've introduced all the necessary reforms precisely to stimulate development and to continue advancing towards the objectives of socialism. In Cuba, for example, we've got many forms of private property. We've got tens of thousands of landowners who own, in some cases, up to 45 hectares. Practically all Cubans own their own homes. And what's more, we're more than open to foreign investment. But none of this detracts from Cuba's socialist character. And, you know, broadly speaking, my position is, if it's good enough for Fidel, it's probably good enough for us. So I've alluded to this already, but I think it bears repeating. China has capitalists, but they don't constitute the ruling class. They don't call the shots. They don't dominate the machinery of the state. They don't control the government. Indeed, they're not even allowed to organise as a class. They're not allowed to form a political party to represent their class interests as people that own and deploy capital. And I often like to quote the Chinese political analyst Eric Lee on this. He's interviewed uh, in John Pilger's documentary, The Coming War on China. And John Pilger asks, well, you know, you've got all this private capital, you've got these markets, you've got this polarisation of wealth in China. Um, isn't it just capitalist? And Eric Lee responds, look, in China, you've got a vibrant market economy, but capital doesn't rise above political authority. Capital doesn't have enshrined rights. In America, the interests of capital and capital itself have risen above the American nation. Political authority cannot check the power of capital. And that's why America is a capitalist country, but China's not. Xi Jinping is certainly clear as to the class structure of Chinese society. The working class is China's leading class. It represents China's advanced productive forces and relations of production. It is our party's most steadfast and reliable class foundation. And it's the main force for upholding and building socialism with Chinese characteristics. As I said, political power in China is consolidated in the working class and its allies. Capitalists can join the CPC these days, but only if they accept and work towards its programme. The country continues to be governed in the interests of ordinary people. And that class orientation is reflected in the government's uh, priorities and also its popularity. Like even studies carried out by Western acad academic institutions, such as the Kennedy School at Harvard, routinely show that China's government has an approval rating comfortably above 90%. The leading political party in the country is a communist party, an organisation that takes Marxism extremely seriously. Marxism is the default worldview in China. Yes, it's actually a very pluralistic society, contrary to all the stereotypes, but all school students learn the basics of Marxism. All the major universities have schools of Marxism. Understanding proletarian history, developing proletarian ideology is a flourishing field. It's certainly not like Britain, where Marxists and communists have to hide their beliefs in order to get a job or to keep their jobs. The Chinese leadership certainly continues to conceive of China's journey in terms of socialism and communism. And Xi Jinping often says, only socialism can save China. And socialism with Chinese characteristics is socialism and not any other kind of ism. The foundational scientific principles of socialism cannot be abandoned. Only if they are abandoned would our system no longer be socialist. So to me at least, it would seem like a very strange conspiracy indeed for all of this to be some kind of elaborate political theatre. In the view of Chinese Marxists, 
the key determining characteristic of socialism isn't the existence of markets or of private capital, but the consolidation of political power in the working class and its allies and society's overall trajectory towards communism. Deng Xiaoping put it very uh, concisely. If markets serve socialism, they are socialist. If they serve capitalism, they are capitalist. And the last thing I'd like to mention is that China's development model is, is actually changing, you know, after four decades of extremely fast growth, which has certainly benefited the country, but which has also created significant environmental problems and social problems. China's moving to a new phase um, and has defined the goal of building a great modern socialist country that is prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious and beautiful by the centenary of the PRC's founding in 2049. This means achieving environmental sustainability, achieving a per capita GDP on a par with the advanced countries, but with common prosperity rather than polarization. It's, you know, it's an extremely inspiring vision and one that I think should give us confidence that Chinese socialism is moving from strength to strength and that we should support that vision, we should learn from it, and we should celebrate China's successes, which are the successes of socialism. They're the successes of our global movement. And to quote Deng again, as he commented to Julius Nyerere, I think in 1989, so long as socialism doesn't collapse in China, it will always hold its ground in the world. Thank you very much.